modern airliners are among the most complex and reliable machines in common use. But occasionally, delays in fixing a known defect have led to disaster. This is the story of one of the most terrifying and avoidable accidents in recent history. When a 747 suffered a devastating explosion at high altitude, the crew and passengers faced an unprecedented crisis. It is also a story of how one family's grief led to a relentless investigation to uncover the full, disturbing truth. Lee can't have died for nothing. You know, you've got to find out why he died and you've just got to make sure that uh, it never happens again. And it reveals how other known problems in aircraft design have continued to go uncorrected, causing further avoidable accidents. So would I be surprised if it happened again? I would be surprised if it didn't happen again. It is a matter of time. One of the most shocking cases of a known design flaw being ignored for years would finally take its toll on a United Airlines 747 bound from Honolulu to Auckland, New Zealand. As Flight 811 prepared for takeoff, the crew were concerned with another kind of threat that had recently led to tragedy. We were in the aftermath of Lockerbie and I had instructed the crew to be particularly aware because um, it was a through flight from Los Angeles going through to New Zealand. So um, in my pre-flight briefing, I had asked them to make sure that they checked uh, any baggage that looked suspicious or anything because uh, we wanted to be extra cautious. Flight 811 was heavily loaded. 337 passengers packed cargo holds and a full fuel load. The doors closed on time and the plane left the gate just before two o'clock in the morning for a routine eight-hour flight. Well, we were going to New Zealand on vacation, some place that we had really thought was interesting and somebody had told us how beautiful it was, so this was kind of a dream come true. I was seated in what's called the upper deck. I hadn't had a vacation in five years. And I took all my mileage plus points from United Airlines and I purchased a business class ticket to Auckland, New Zealand and Sydney, Australia. And I was gonna finally make that dream vacation I'd always wanted to get to uh, Australia and lay on a beach somewhere and forget about airplanes, forget about accidents and, and, and get this out of my mind for a while. On the flight deck, Captain Dave Cronin was hugely experienced, just two months short of retirement. Okay. I flew uh, almost 35 years with United. I've got over 30,000 hours of flight time and just about everything uh, military as well as uh, civilian. My co-pilot, our first officer, was uh, Al Slater. And I've known Al at that time for probably 20 years. And uh, the second officer, Mark Thomas, was the first time I had flown with him. But uh, we got along real well. Tell him we can handle 33 if it's available. OK. The pilots wanted to climb to 33,000 feet above the Pacific Ocean to avoid turbulence from bad weather. We did notice that there were thunderstorms so 100 miles south, right on course, which was rather unusual for that time of night. So I left the seatbelt sign on. Captain Cronin's decision to keep people fastened in their seats would save the lives of many. We were still climbing out, and the seatbelt sign was still on, and um, just basically getting ready to uh, serve beverages and then to tuck everyone in for the evening because it was going to be a long flight down to New Zealand. OK, tell them we're going to detour over to the left. Center, United 811 Heavy, we're going to be detouring. Some weather here, uh, it'll be to the left, of course. A hundred miles from Honolulu, 
as Flight 811 climbed through 23,000 feet, a critical malfunction was about to occur. There was now a huge air pressure difference between the inside and outside of the aircraft. Suddenly, passengers sitting just above and behind the cargo door heard a noise. Then there was kind of a grinding noise. I heard a, like a thud. The hell? In the next nanosecond, it was pure, unadulterated pandemonium. We lost number three. We're going down. It looks like we've lost number three engine and we're descending rapidly. Coming back. The next thing I knew, I found myself on the stairwell, hanging on to the rungs, and I immediately knew it was an explosive decompression. The cargo door had torn off and ripped a huge section of the plane with it. The pressurized air inside blasted out with explosive force. I immediately thought of Lockerbie. We actually thought it was a bomb that went off. It was hell on earth. Everything on the airplane that wasn't fastened down, tied down, or secured, what became airborne. Um, the noise was incredible. Everything in front of us was gone. Where we were sitting, we were about six inches from the hole, so there was nothing in front of us or to the side of us. The whole side of the plane was gone. Actually, our feet were dangling on the hole, and uh, I first thought we, we weren't going to make it. You know, I just didn't think there was any hope. With the pressurized air blown out, the lack of oxygen at 23,000 feet was now suffocating the passengers and crew. It felt like someone had kicked me in the stomach, um, knocked the wind out of me, and um, I remember trying to catch my breath and couldn't. You're supposed to grab those oxygen masks and put them on, except the oxygen masks in that cabin, they were ripped out of the ceiling and they weren't, they weren't there. And um, they, I remember thinking to myself, this is what it feels like to suffocate. United 811 Heavy, we're doing an emergency descent. The pilots could tell from their instruments that the number three engine was failing, but they couldn't tell the full extent of the damage. Their priority was to get the plane down to a level where they could breathe normally. Put your mask on, Dave. But the pilots didn't know that the explosion had destroyed the entire oxygen supply. I can't get any oxygen. We're not getting any oxygen. You getting any? I can't get any either. With the plane heading steeply down and no word from the cockpit, the cabin crew feared the worst. I remember thinking that the cockpit, which is up in the upper deck, had probably blown off the airplane too, because as far up as we could see, there was nothing there. Now we're doing this nosedive. My, my next thought was, oh my god, we're, we're just going straight down. We're going to crash into the sea. With its airframe ruptured, severe damage to the right wing and engines, and the crew forcing it down in an emergency descent, the problems on Flight 811 had only just begun. Two minutes after suffering a devastating explosive decompression, Flight 811 was still in a steep emergency descent, passing rapidly through 15,000 feet to reach breathable air. United 811 Heavy, say your altitude now. Leaving 15. United 811 Heavy, we're out of 15.5. United 811, roger. I think we blew a door or something. Tell a flight attendant to get prepared for an evacuation. The crew finally began to level out at a safer altitude but they now faced a barrage of problems. The most immediate was the disintegration of the number three engine, nearest to the explosion. We don't have any fire indications? I... I don't have anything. Okay, we lost number three. Let's shut it down, there's no M1. Yeah, okay. Ready for number three shutdown checklist. Uh, number three, before you shut down number three, the generator went off. Looks all right to try it now. Well, 
Let's stop the vibration anyway. The old jettison procedure. Main boost pumps. On. Center, United 811. We need the equipment standing by. Company notified, please. We got a control United problem. Roger. Center wing. Left, right. Valves. On. Start dumping the fuel. I am dumping. One stewardess had been seriously injured by falling debris. As Laura Brentlinger helped her, the full gravity of their situation suddenly became clear. As I'm holding her in my arms, I looked up, and as I looked up, that was the first time I saw this tremendous hole on the side of the aircraft that was just a void, and seats were missing, and I immediately knew that we had lost passengers. Five rows of seats had been blown out in the decompression, killing nine passengers. On the flight deck, the crew had turned the stricken plane back to Honolulu, but with 80 miles still to go, the crisis now got far worse. We got a hell of a control problem here. I got almost full rudder on this thing. Are you dumping as fast as you can? I'm dumping everything. We got a problem with number four engine? Yeah. Debris from the explosion had also damaged the number four engine. If it failed completely, the implications were severe. If you are on two engines and you weigh 700,000 pounds, that is a big deal. Simply because with that kind of weight, two engines are not going to keep you in the air. You're going to come down. Can you maintain 240? Yeah, just barely. We're losing altitude. No, it's... Center, United 811 Heavy. Do you have a fix on us? Affirmative, sir. I have you on radar. OK, uh, we've lost engine number three, and we don't have full power on engine number four. Uh, we can't hold altitude right now. Uh, we're dumping fuel, so... United 11 Heavy, roger. I show you six zero miles south of Honolulu at this time. Uh, roger. I haven't talked to anybody yet. I, I can't get to them. Uh, you want me to go downstairs and take a look? Yeah, let's see what's happening down there. I think I, uh, we lost a compressor, but... Can't uh, hold... Can't hold altitude. Yeah, I told him that we're Put gonna... Put some axe on there. I got takeoff power on this thing. Whatever you need, Captain. Although the number four engine was failing, the pilots pushed it, along with the remaining engines, to full power, a setting they should not be run at for more than four minutes. But the nearest land was 15 minutes away. I look out the window on the right-hand side, and I see flames, big flames. And I know what flames in the engine means. It's not good. The pilots were unaware that the number four engine was now on fire. You got 250 knots now, that's good, uh, 7,000. Uh, yeah, oh, we're getting more rumble. Watch your heading, watch your heading. You want to go direct Honolulu. OK, I'm, I'm yeah. going to go downstairs and see what the hell is going on. Yeah. Go ahead and run down and see what's happening. I saw the flight engineer descend down the stairwell. And when I saw him, my, my relief was, oh my god, they're, they're alive. And I, there was a huge sense of relief for me. He saw the hole, turned as white as a sheet, and I screamed to him, dear God, please get us down. We got a fire out there. Oh yeah, we got a fire in number four. Go through the procedure, shut down the engine. We're not gonna be able to hold this altitude on two. We got a fire on the right side. We're on two engines now. The whole right side, it's, it's just gone from about the one right back to a, it's just open. You're just looking outside. What do you mean? It looks like a bomb. Fuselage? Yeah, the fuselage, it's just, it's just open. Okay, it looks like we got a bomb that went off on the right side. The whole right side is gone. Yeah, from, from about the one right back to uh, anybody. Some people are probably gone, I, I don't know. I knew that we had lost people. I didn't know how many. Uh, in fact, I didn't know until the next day how many were lost. But, uh, you know, it's, it's a terrible thing when you're a captain of an airplane and you lose passengers. Lee Campbell, flying home to New Zealand, was sitting in row 10 just in front of the cargo door. I woke up with 
such a start because I had seen Lee standing by the bed, just with this with a grey jacket over his arm and a small smile on his face. And of course, as I woke up, it faded, wasn't there. And then we woke up in the morning, we discussed this. I said, oh, no, that was strange in the night, but I, it was such a, a vivid dream. Lee was standing there. And then the radio came on, and the first item of news is that there'd been a problem with the United aircraft. And I said, that was Lee, that's Lee's. And my blood just ran cold. I, I knew he was dead from that moment. Center, do you read? We evidently had a bomb or something. A big section of the right side of the airplane is missing. 9 heavy, roger. I wouldn't go any faster than I had to because that, that pull, I mean, I, I wouldn't get it over 250 knots because that's a big... Okay, what's, what's our stall speed? I wouldn't go below 240. Yeah. I don't know if we're going to make this. We didn't know that we were going to make it back. So we were actually preparing to ditch that airplane at night uh, in the Pacific Ocean, which has never been done before. In the cabin, the crew prepared for the worst. My training kicked in and um, got up for my jump seat and started instructing the crew, um, we have to prepare the cabin, we have to, you know, prepare for a ditching, which I thought was inevitable. You're running around getting life vests on, and I do remember thinking, I'm not sure this is going to matter, um, because when we hit the water, you know, um, I just imagine the plane's going to split apart. I, I knew that if we hit the water, it would be a tantamount to hitting the ground, and there would be very few, if any, survivors. So my mind went to... to the things that, that meant something to me, and at that point in my life, it was my son. Believing they were going to die, one passenger took these photographs in the hope they'd be found in the wreckage and give clues to the cause of the crash. For 15 minutes, the plane steadily lost altitude. Then, at 4,000 feet, the first glimmer of hope. After an imponderable time, um, I remember one of the passengers began to point out one of the windows on the right side. And everybody looked. And we looked through this little window from wherever we were, and we could see a point of light, and another point of light, and another point. And pretty soon, you could make out a coastline. OK, I've got lights over here. OK. OK, now we're at four. Uh, we're 21 miles out. We're in good shape. At Honolulu Airport, an emergency was declared. All other aircraft were diverted and the rescue services prepared for the crash landing of a fully loaded airliner. Yeah, you want to give me some speeds? Yeah. Uh, 150 is going to be your two engine. Uh, use a 160. I need souls on board if you have it. OK, souls on board. 160 is the minimum. Uh, stand by, United 811 Heavy. I don't know how many's on board. Uh, 200 and... Uh, I don't have the paperwork in front of me here. Uh, we're too busy right now. Uh, 200 and something. Okay. Six minutes from the airport, the crew now had to slow the overweight plane for landing. But the effect of this was unknown. What's going to happen when I start coming out with flaps and landing gear? Uh, we're either going to land on the airport, in the water, or downtown Honolulu. We'll try 10. OK, inboards are coming to 10. Out of the controls field. All right so far. But the flaps were damaged and could not fully extend. This meant that Flight 811 would have to land dangerously fast. Navy 811 Heavy, do you have the airport in sight? It's over here to the right, Captain. OK. OK, we have the airport. United 811 Heavy. 811 is clear to land. 8 left. Equipment standing by. Wind 05012. 
Clear to land. Eight left, United 811 Heavy. As the unstable 747 lined up for landing, the pilots knew they would only have one attempt. But even if they got it on the runway, the nagging question remained. Would the stress of impact cause the damaged and overweight aircraft to disintegrate? Severely damaged, with an unstable airframe and losing altitude on just two engines, Flight 811 now began its final approach to Honolulu Airport. Two-engine approach. Two-engine approach. We still had no idea how far off the ground we were, if we were going to make it to Honolulu or not. But that seemed like an appropriate time if we were somewhere around land that we were probably going to try and land somewhere to um, get the passengers in their brace positions. So that's when we started yelling for them to get down in their brace positions. Every molecule in my body combined to express, get this damn airplane on the ground. Well, how are we doing on the hydraulics? Hydraulics are good. You got brakes? Normal hydraulics. So we got brakes, but uh, you're only going to have reversing on one and two. Though I thought maybe there was a chance that we were going to actually be able to attempt to land, the thought came to my mind, what happens now? Do we, on impact, do we explode? Do we fall out this huge hole? Despite dumping fuel, the aircraft was still critically overweight. But without full flaps to keep it in the air, it had to approach fast. A thousand down. The danger was that the undercarriage could shear off and the plane break up. Up and a half high. 190. One eighty five. A little slow, a little slow, Dave. Let's blow what we want. Coming up on the glide slope. Let's try the gear. No one knew if the explosion had damaged the landing gear. I remember Laura saying to me that she didn't hear the landing gear go down. And it was loud, you know, the, it was still loud. And I didn't hear the landing gear go down. So that's another thought. Maybe they can't get the landing gear down. Maybe it's not down. Got gear down, we're clear to land, and everything's taken care of as far as we know. Two hundred. One ninety five. Half a dot high. Looking, looking good. One ninety two. One ninety five. Coming off on the power. One hundred feet. Fifty feet. Center the trim. Center the trim. Thirty. Ten. Zero. We're on. Gears holding. We landed. It felt fast. And that was my next concern, is that we weren't going to stop at the end of the runway, that we were just going to keep going. And all of a sudden, we were slowing down, slowing down. And I, I said, oh my god, we've landed. We're, we're on, on ground. And the people started applauding. Probably the best landing I've ever made. When we uh, finally stopped on the runway, 
We deployed all 10 chutes, and the flight attendants evacuated all of passengers. It's amazing how fast everyone went. My understanding is like less than 45 seconds, 330 people were off the airplane. We were probably 20 feet off the ground, and I would have stepped out of the airplane without a slide. I, I wanted to get off so bad. Fortunately, there was a slide. I stepped into the abyss, fell into the slide, whoosh down to the, to the bottom of the thing, and then you, you, you hit feet running. The slide kind of kicked me up and flew me up into the air, and, I, and I, my thought was, oh my God, I'm gonna survive this whole thing, and I'm gonna get wiped out here on the evacuation because it just really threw me. And I landed and scraped up my legs pretty badly and landed on my feet. And it wasn't until that moment that I had the sense of, I'm here, I'm okay, I'm on the ground. When we got all our switches off, I ran through the airplane, made sure there was no one else on the airplane, came up to the door one left, and went down the slide. And I came around the front and I saw that humongous hole in the side and I just couldn't believe it. By the grace of God, we made it, and uh, it was a, a, an awesome experience. I, I would never want to go through that again. It was crazy, it was wild, it was scary, all at the same time. Um, I just thought that that was the end, that we were gonna die. I mean, it, it, that was my first thought, that this is the end. But for the families of the nine people who were killed, the ordeal was only beginning. Kevin and Susan Campbell's son, Lee, had been flying home. About three o'clock in the afternoon, I think they said that uh, there was no New Zealanders involved, but we just knew that, that it, it was Lee. And then about, I suppose, a quarter of an hour later, we got a phone call from Chicago and they just said that they, they regret to inform us that our son was missing, presumed dead. And I guess about another hour after that, a policeman arrived at the door and he took one look at us and he says, I can see that you've had the news. So um, it was just, just an awful, awful day. And uh, it certainly didn't get much better for a long, long time. Although Lee's body had not been recovered, the Campbells flew straight to the wrecked aircraft in Honolulu. Your initial feeling is that you want to be as close to the spot where your relative died, um, and that was the aircraft. So we had to immediately go in and see the aircraft. The damage inside was horrific, just a total mess. And the hole in the side of the aircraft was much bigger than I had thought it would be, even though we had seen television news reel reports. And it was so sad to get in and actually see where Lee's seat had been. The legs of the seat were still there. There was a good bit of fuselage beside him and still a window. But the Campbell's desire to find the cause of Lee's death inevitably brought them face to face with dreadful details. They took us to the medical examiner's office as well um, because they had found body parts and, and that sort of thing. So um, they didn't actually show us the body parts but they showed us bits and pieces that they had recovered from the engines and um, we got the medical examiner's report on what they had recovered. So, um, you know, we really would have preferred that it was Lee that went through the engine because it would have been an immediate death, whereas it was a four minute fall down to the ocean and we know that the people could have been alive as they were falling. And when you think about that, that's just horrific. As it became clear that their son's body would never be found, the Campbell's need to find the cause of the accident that killed him grew stronger. 
Lee can't have died for nothing. You know, you've got to find out why he died and you've just got to make sure that uh, it never happens again. The Campbells embarked on a relentless personal investigation that would last nearly two years. The loss of their son meant they would stop at nothing to uncover the truth. The engines number three and four. Two four months after the accident on Flight 811, when the National Transportation Safety Board held preliminary hearings, the Campbells made sure they were there. But they soon grew frustrated. The NTSB would not complete its report for months, so the Campbells took matters into their own hands. We certainly weren't going to leave it to the, the NTSB to, to come up with the findings. We were going to follow through. And when the hearings ended, they had said that we could take whatever we wanted off the press table. And Susan walked up to the top table and yelled out, there's a, a really good set up here. So I uh, grabbed a box and loaded in all of the, the documents that we could find up there. Kevin's the most honest of people I know, but here he was taking something that we hadn't specifically been told we could take. And we're heading out the door just as the NTSB were arriving back in with the trolley to, to pick up all their documents. So we were out the door and into a taxi and gone. So we quickly realised we'd got a really good set of papers with a lot of things that hadn't been released to the public. We were able to really start our investigation in earnest at that stage. The unpublished documents revealed a disturbing catalogue of problems with the forward cargo door, going right back to its original design. Instead of a plug door that gets jammed into its frame as the aircraft pressurises, Boeing opted for an outward opening door. This allowed for more cargo space, but was not fail-safe like the plug design. So Boeing built what they believed was a foolproof locking mechanism. What they do is they build in multiple redundancies to make sure the door is properly latched and does not open. Uh, and you, you build it in to a point of, uh, that it's extremely improbable that the door would ever open. So what went wrong on Flight 811? The Campbells soon discovered that the problem lay in the design of the locking mechanism. To lock the cargo door on the 747, electric motors rotate C-shaped latches around pins in the door frame. A handle then moves arms, known as locking sectors, over the top of the C-latches to prevent them from reopening. But as early as 1975, problems were found with the locking sectors. Kevin Campbell, an engineer by training, built a model to show the weakness in the Boeing design. Initially, the, the locking sectors were made in aluminium, and in 1975, Boeing realized that they weren't strong enough, and they actually doubled up the aluminium to make it double thickness. But it still wasn't uh, strong enough, and a lot of the airlines didn't even put the doublers on anyway. The weakness of the aluminium drastically increased the risk of the door accidentally opening. With the aluminium locking sectors, if the sea locks tried to backwind, open electrically, it would just push the locking sector out of the way. It just simply wasn't up to the job that it was designed for. For 20 years, 747s have been flying with this crucial weakness. The Campbells wondered what else remained to be revealed. They redoubled their efforts to uncover the full truth behind the accident that had killed their son. We bought a car and set off in the United States to see as many people who were involved with the accident as possible. We started at Seattle, down to Denver, across to Chicago, through to Washington, D.C., down to Kentucky, on to Miami, and back across to San Diego, back up through San Francisco, back to Seattle. And that was just one trip. The Campbells soon found that a shockingly similar incident to Flight 811 
had given clear warnings of the dangers in the cargo door. In 1987, two years before Flight 811, a Pan Am 747 had been climbing out of Heathrow when it failed to pressurize at 20,000 feet. The pilots had to turn back. When they got back to Heathrow, they found that the door was hanging open an inch and a half at the bottom, and all of the locks were open. When it got to the maintenance base, they found that uh, all of the, the locking sectors were either bent or broken. Why had the sea latches turned and bent back the locking sectors? Boeing claimed that the ground crew must have mishandled the mechanism. The door had been closed manually, and what they said happened was that the guy wound the sea locks closed, 98 turns of a speed wrench. He closed the outer handle and then wound it open again. And if to be in the position that they were found in when the aircraft got back, he would have had to wind them open 98 turns. And this is just absolutely ridiculous. But the Campbell's investigation uncovered another vital clue to why the sea latches had turned. A report by Pan Am engineers highlighted problems with the door's electrical system. It had a fault in the S2 master latch lock switch that should have turned off the power to the, uh, the door when the outer handle was closed. This was an alarming finding. When the outer handle was closed, the S2 master lock switch was meant to disconnect the power supply and stop the sea latch motors from turning. So could this have failed, allowing the motors to open the door? To find out, Boeing asked the airlines to do a simple test. Close the outer handle, then press the switch to open the door and see what happens. When they hit the switch, it actually worked. The Boeing thought, you know, this is not going to work, um, but it actually worked. There was power to the, the door locks with the, uh, with the outer handle closed, and the lock started to move, and it started to force the locking sectors out of the way. And uh, a few days later, the airline started ringing in and saying it was damaging their planes. So Boeing stopped the test. But it meant that on those aircraft, the S2 switch had failed, which is a silent failure and all of those aircraft were, were likely to have the same problem as A11. They were just waiting for a short circuit to open the doors. The Campbells now became convinced that the accident on Flight 811 began with the failure of the S2 switch. Power remained on to the sea latch motors. All it took was a short circuit in the 20-year-old wiring, which had been found to be frayed on other aircraft, to start the motors up. The aluminium locking sectors were too weak to stop the latches turning, and the cargo door burst open. The National Transportation Safety Board determines that the probable cause of this accident was the... After waiting a year for the NTSB report, Kevin and Susan Campbell expected it to match their theory of what had led to the accident on Flight 811. I assumed that we would have a report come out that this was an electrical malfunction and were staggered when they came out and said that the door had been mishandled. The report focused entirely on the fact that the door lock must have been mishandled by the ramp attendant. That was disappointing and we felt that they must have been at a different hearing from the one we were at. So how had the NTSB come to their conclusion? There was other evidence that we had found during our investigation of uh, improper procedures by the United Mechanics and, and ramp people. So we were convinced that there was, um, we could use the word abuse being done on the doors. The doors were sort of abused and weren't maintained very well. We concluded that the probable cause was mechanical. For the Campbells, the NTSB's failure to mention the electrical problems just wasn't good enough. What they said happened was the door was closed, the locks didn't fully close, they just partially closed, just hanging on the, the pins, and then they closed the outer handle. But it just simply can't happen because that part of the locking sector is, is still intact. Just simply can't happen. You can't close the outer handle unless these are in the fully locked position. 
It's the only way that the outer handle will close. And just closing this manually, you can't exert enough force to actually damage this part of the locking sector. All it does is just butts up against there. If the locks aren't fully closed, it just simply butts up against them and goes no further. They went back to investigating the accident on Flight 811 and soon found disturbing evidence of how it could and should have been prevented. After the Pan Am incident in 1987, it turned out that Boeing had issued a directive to the airlines on how to correct the weak aluminium locking sectors. The airworthiness directive that came out was to replace the aluminum sectors with steel sectors that could not be bent. And there were some additionally, in, some interim requirements for inspections to be performed uh, until the, what they call terminating action, the uh, steel sectors were installed. The fix was cheap and simple, but getting it done was not. The actual cost of the modification, changing these locking sectors to steel, was 2,000 US dollars per aircraft. But it took 10 hours to do it, and that's where the money was, taking the, the aircraft out of service for 10 hours. That's millions of dollars. The Campbells found that back in 1987, the Federal Aviation Administration, who were meant to enforce improvements, had given the airlines 18 months to comply with the modification. Within a year, Lee Campbell and eight others would die in an avoidable accident. So why weren't the airlines forced to fix the problem sooner? If these airplanes, these large commercial airplanes, are grounded, it's an economic disaster. So what they do is they lobby in the regulatory agency in the United States, it's the FAA, um, to allow them to do the fixes over time when the airplanes are in for normal maintenance. And that way, they're not taken out of service. But when they do that, when they allow the airlines, the air carriers, and the manufacturers to fix these over time, in essence, what the FAA is doing is they're gambling with the lives of the passengers and the crew that are flying the airplanes during the time they're not fixed. After the deaths on Flight 811, the FAA instantly shortened the deadline for fixing the cargo door from 18 months to just 30 days. It was only when United had gone from one of the airlines of first resort to one of the airlines of last resort in New Zealand that they, just totally out of the blue, we got a, a letter inviting us over to see them. And when we got there, they were just going to do a PR exercise on us. But uh, we just laid into them, pointed out where they'd all got it wrong. And you could see them changing during it to, to realising that we did know what we were talking about and that we'd put a lot of serious effort into it. One of them actually broke down because um, I'd never had to meet next of kin before. And it ended up with um, the vice president of United taking us round the uh, maintenance facility and he had people running off in all directions just to get the information that we wanted, questions answered. We could go anywhere with that we wanted. And uh, we just, everything was, was laid on for us because they, they, at that stage they realised that we really did know what we were talking about. The pressure of the Campbell's campaign eventually began to pay off. The vital piece of evidence that could prove them right, the cargo door, still lay two miles down in the Pacific Ocean. But as articles appeared in the American press, the NTSB commissioned the US Navy to search for it. A hundred miles south of Honolulu, a deep submersible began to trawl the seabed. We went to Honolulu and uh, waited there while they had their attempts. And they finally recovered the door from 14,000 feet of water, which was the deepest recovery ever at that time. 
and we were phoned within an hour of it coming out of the water. But before the Campbells could see it, the door was swiftly removed to Boeing's plant in Seattle. The Campbells went in hot pursuit. We went over to Boeing and they wouldn't show it to us. So they, they reckoned that uh, the crucial pieces had gone to the NTSB. So again, we got in the car and drove across to, to Washington, D.C. We arrived at Ron Schleed's office, and Ron looks at his watch and he says, I can give you five minutes. So about three hours later, we had the, the pieces that they recovered in our hand and they acknowledged that we were definitely correct, it was an electrical malfunction, and that they said they would fix the planes, they would make sure it never happens again, but just don't hold your breath that the report will never be changed. Even with the evidence of an electrical malfunction in their hands, the NTSB refused to change their report. Then, in June 1991, fate intervened. A four-year-old United 747 was sitting on the apron in New York when the sea latch motor started up and the door opened itself. There was no way that they could hide it any longer. They simply couldn't deny that it was an electrical malfunction that was covering it. After recovery of the door was that in fact the actual... Finally, the NTSB publicly issued a revised report that concurred with the Campbell's version. There was an inadvertent failure of either the switch or the wiring that caused an uncommanded opening of the door. It's nice that other people know that you're right and had been all along, and that the support that they had given you was, you know, was vindicated. The Campbells spent thousands of dollars of their own money on their campaign. They were never interested in a financial settlement for Lee's death, but they did persuade United and Boeing to set up a university scholarship in his name. I couldn't have lived with myself if we had done no investigating ourselves. It was just something we both felt we needed to do. We didn't even discuss it. We just knew that's what we would do. Yeah. But despite long and public campaigns like that of the Campbells, critics fear that the airline industry has not learnt the lessons from Flight 811. The regulatory agencies, they have a dual charge. One is to encourage aviation, and another is aviation safety. And when they get in a position where you have economics up against air safety, they tend to err on the side of economics rather than safety. Serious accidents caused by known defects have continued to occur. In the 1990s, known problems with icing on aircraft wings caused a series of crashes. At least three planes have had fatal fires due to known dangers from flammable insulation material. And in 1996, a fully laden 747 blew itself up when known faults in the wiring are thought to have ignited flammable vapors in the fuel tanks. Inevitably, experts are skeptical about the aviation industry's record of balancing profit against prevention. We've seen the wiring problem both in United 811, which was eventually turned out to be the cause of that accident, and also in uh, TWA 800, where we had an explosion in the centerland fuel tank. This, the, the industry answer to 20 and 30 year old wiring, and when the wiring can fray, break, crack, cause a short, which can either ignite fuel, like in, in TWA 800, or open a cargo door, like in United 11, and what the industry says, don't touch it. Don't go in there. Don't inspect it. Don't try to fix it. Don't try to remove it because it's so brittle that if you go in there to try to fix it, you're going to do more damage than you can do good. And, and that's what I call the ostrich approach to maintenance and safety. You know, we've decided that you can have an spark of ignition in the centerline fuel tank of a large air carrier. Um, but so far we've been lucky, we've only had one every 10 years, we've only blown up three or four airplanes. Um, you know, to go in and replace this wiring would ground all these airplanes, would be astronomically expensive. You know, one airplane every 10 years, one airplane every five years, two, three hundred people, cost of doing business. Cost of doing business. And, and that's a great economic analysis, and unless your mother 
or your child is on board one of these airplanes that happens to pay the price for their economic satisfaction. For some of the survivors of Flight 811, the cost has been heavy. Each crew member handled it differently. I know there are still two crew members that have never set foot on an aircraft again. It was very difficult for me. I was diagnosed with uh, severe post-traumatic stress disorder. You can't reason, you can't think. Making the slightest decision is, is very difficult. You're, you're just at a total loss. So it was very difficult to cope with. 3,000? We're not getting any oxygen. We have the terrain alarm. We're going to get our aero crew 603. We are in an emergency. See anything. Damn, we're off course. No, I can't see it. We're way off. On June the 1st, 1999, as an American Airlines jet prepared to land amid fierce thunderstorms, passengers knew they were flying into trouble. I don't know what made me aware, so doggone aware, that we were going to have a problem. Oh, no. Within minutes, their worst fears would be realized. Other one! Other one! I'm yelling, get away from the plane. Run, get away from the plane. I don't know where we're at, but there's a road that goes around the airport. Well, we've got a lot of people hurt. This film tells the story of a tragic and avoidable disaster. The investigation would reveal a lethal combination of pilot error, the devastating effects of severe weather, and a dangerous race to keep the plane on schedule. It would also uncover disturbing evidence of an industry-wide failing one that could kill again at any time. Despite reliable aircraft and extensive training, modern airlines and their crews face unprecedented pressures. Intense industry competition demands that the whole system, from the flight planners to the pilots, be efficient and on time. The stresses this can bring would play a vital role in the loss of Flight 1420. For a large operator like American Airlines, the pressures start with a complex task of scheduling their vast fleet. Dispatchers direct the planes around the world in a carefully choreographed dance. The strain of maintaining this efficiency affects the entire system. Of course, competition has become very intense, a lot of pressure on the dispatchers, pilots, flight attendants, and basically the whole infrastructure to accomplish the mission and make a dollar. Every effort is made to ensure that nothing disrupts these fragile schedules. But there is one variable that no airline can control, the weather. The southern states of America are especially prone to severe weather. Storms not only cause delays, but pose extreme dangers to commercial jets. Delays, scheduling problems, and fierce thunderstorms would all conspire to turn a routine flight into a terrifying race against time. On June 1, 1999, American Airlines Flight 1420 is running late. The movement of the storm is everything is sliding to the southeast. So yes, we do have a stormy evening headed our way. The delay of Flight 1420 put pressure on the pilots even before takeoff. The responsibility can fall on flight crews to keep a tight schedule on track. Dispatch, please. Yeah, it's Michael Argo. 
Crews have strict legal limits on their duty time. The first officer warned the dispatcher that they were in danger of running out of time. The flight had to take off in the next hour or be cancelled. The pilots also became aware of another pressure caused by deteriorating weather near their destination. The pilots had a weather briefing that they got before they departed Dallas-Fort Worth, which provided the forecasts, the weather alerts. The dispatcher and the captain preparing for the flight uh, looked at the weather information and thought they could get to Little Rock before the thunderstorms impacted. The 139 passengers just wanted to get home. I was traveling with my son and my daughter. We were coming home from our vacation. It was my daughter's first flight. The plane was late and there were a lot of delays, of course. It was tiring, it was frustrating, it was late at night. They soon began to sense that flight 1420 was racing against the weather. As they called for us to board the plane, they wanted us there and just to get on really quickly. Just get on, sit down, put your seatbelt on, we're going. They did mention that there was bad weather between us and Little Rock. They wanted to get ahead of the bad weather coming into Little Rock. Finally, over two hours behind schedule, Flight 1420 leaves Dallas. Unknown to the crew, the storms are already massing around Little Rock. 40 minutes later, 1420 is 100 miles from its destination. At this point, the voice recorder transcript reveals a calm and steady cockpit routine. American 1420, you gonna still want lower? Yeah, so far, it's okay. So far, so good, ma'am. American 1420 will let you know. The first officer on American 1420 was a new hire. He had just recently completed training and he had been paired on one of his first trips with this management captain. So now you had a very experienced pilot sitting in the left seat with the company, paired with a relatively new hire. Bushman and Oregola are clearly relaxed as they plan their approach and landing. 25 for 24, set and armed. I think this stuff's gonna work out pretty well. Yeah, we're almost down to max landing weight. Uh, there's a moon out, or a spaceship. Oh, it's the mothership. Center pump's coming off. All right. The pilots are keeping a close eye on the storms ahead. Onboard weather radar scans a cone-shaped area of sky in front of the plane. Potentially severe storms show up in red. There's your big wad diddly. Yeah, we got to get over there real quick. Don't like that. That's lightning. Sure is. The American Airlines dispatcher issued an update on the shape and formation of the thunderstorms. Right now on radar, there's a large slot to Little Rock. Thunderstorms are on the left and right, and Little Rock is in the clear, sort of like a bowling alley approach. Thunderstorms are moving east, north, eastward towards Little Rock, and they may be a factor for our arrival. I suggest expediting our arrival. The dispatcher gave this flight crew the weather information. It appeared to him that there was going to be a gap, or a, what he called the bowling alley, where you had two types of thunderstorms or two thunderstorms with an alley between it, and that the flight crew, if they had expedited their travel to Little Rock, could probably make it up that alley be before the, the two storms closed together. But as flight 1420 descends, the plan to beat the storms is about to go seriously wrong. The pilots do not realize that the walls of the bowling alley are closing in. The route flown by American Airlines flight 1420 is flanked by treacherous thunderstorms a corridor the pilots call the Bowling Alley. With 80 miles to go, the path to Little Rock still appears to be clear. This is the Bowling Alley right here. Yeah, I know. In fact, there are the city lights, straight there. You want to go down? Not yet, but pretty soon. 
Uh, we're about 80 miles uh, from the airport, and we started our descent uh, toward it. Quite a light show on the side of the aircraft, and we're going to be passing that on our way to Little Rock. Uh, it's been a pleasure having you aboard our short flight. And I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you for flying American Airlines. The lightning seemed to be on both sides of the plane. It lit up the inside of the plane. Very quick, you know, just kaboom type <laughs> lightning, which was a little scary. There was quite a light show off to the left. Normally that doesn't get pointed out. If you go past the Grand Canyon, that gets pointed out, but not a lightning show. As the plane descends, transcripts of the cockpit voice recordings show that the pilots are aware of rough weather ahead. Descent check's complete. We gotta get there quick. Yep. Sit them down early. I think it's going to get a little bumpy here again, uh, if you don't mind. Uh, do we need to sit down? Uh, well, how far through are you? Um, we're almost done, but not quite. Well, finish it up real quick. OK. I thought it was more turbulent than normal. I remember especially watching the flight attendant. And I was looking at her with amazement. I was wondering, how could she hold those trays and the drinks and, and not spill everything. From that point, you know, it just got worse. With flaps 40, 130,000 pounds, 200 feet. As they prepare for landing, the pressure on the pilots will now steadily rack up. Not required. Manual brakes. Uh, manual's fine. At first, as the crew pick their way around the storms, everything seems steady. Yeah, actually, there's a city right there. Yeah. Breaking through this crowd, good, doing good. Even when the first indication comes that the storms are advancing, the pilots take it in their stride. Whoa, looks like it's moving this way, though. Yeah. Just some lightning straight ahead. I think we're gonna be okay, though. Right there. Yep, right down the bowling alley. As my friends would say, California cool. Cool. Peachy. Exactly. 1420 at 11.3 for 10,000. But when the pilots contact the controller at Little Rock, he gives the first of a series of alarming weather alerts. Roger. Uh, we've got a thunderstorm just northwest of the airport moving through the area now. Uh, wind is 280 at 2.8 gusts 4.4, and uh, I'll have new weather for you in just a moment, I'm sure. Gale force winds are gusting to 50 miles per hour, enough to blow tiles off a rooftop. High winds pose a severe hazard for Flight 1420. Crosswinds could make it difficult to control the plane on landing. The pilots must quickly determine if they're within safe limits. They calculate the strength of the crosswind from its angle to their final approach. All right, so that's uh, 280 at 44. Uh, gusts at 44. Right, near the limit. Well, uh, it's 40 degrees off. I mean, you're not out of the limit because of the angle, but, but, but that's pretty close. The crosswind limit for landing is 30 knots on a dry runway, but Bushman and Oregon now become confused about what happens if it rains. Well, 30 knots is the crosswind limitation, but see, 30 knots, that's well, dry. wet. Yeah, dry. What's the wet? 20. It's 25. The discussion is never resolved and the crosswinds will soon be gusting well over the limit. Flight attendants, uh, prepare for landing, please. The pilot's attention now returns to the bad weather ahead. He said the storm was to the northwest of the field? He said northwest. Yeah. Lightning strike, he said storm. But the task of tracking the storms is made more difficult by the lack of sophisticated radar at Little Rock. Uh, American 1420, um, your equipment's a lot better than uh, what I have. How's that final for 2-2 left looking? What's that? Uh, we can see the airport, but uh, we can just barely make it out. Uh, we should be able to make 2-2. That storm is moving closer, like your radar says. But it's a little farther off than you thought. The controllers are going, well, your radar is, is better than mine, so forth. 
The controller in this accident had a monochromatic or basically almost a black and white set of a radar and could not determine the intensities of the storm. Just eight miles from the airport, the pilots now face another key decision, how to approach the runway through bad weather. Controllers routinely ask pilots if they want to land visually instead of relying on the airport's electronic instrument landing system, or ILS. But a visual approach means they must be able to see the runway, and this is proving difficult. Uh, no, we can't really make it out right now. Uh, we're gonna have to stay with you as long as possible. Now, as the wind suddenly changes direction, the pilot's problems quickly mount up. Uh, the wind's kind of kicked around a little bit right now. It's 330 at 1-1. Whoa. It's a little better than I was. Yet 3.30 is tailwind, though. The crew now face the problem of having the wind behind them when they land, greatly increasing the dangers of overshooting the runway. Then the controller calls in with more bad news. Uh, right now, I have a wind shear alert. Wind shear is a sudden change of wind direction over a short distance. It is one of the most feared elements of a severe thunderstorm. To combat constantly shifting winds, the pilots are forced to throw away their previous approach plans and start again. They have to reverse the direction of their approach, so they will be landing into the wind. Yeah, we're gonna need, uh, or... We would rather go into the headwind, sir. The pilot's decision to land in the opposite direction is a prudent move, but it will create serious problems. Okay, a right turn 250. The long way around? Uh, yes, sir. You're a little close to the airport. Yeah, right. 250, that'll work. As the pilots turn to their new approach, the aircraft's weather radar, which scans in front of the plane, loses track of the thunderstorms. Worse still, the turn delays landing by more than 10 minutes. And with every passing moment, the storms are growing in intensity. Runway four right, 111.3042. I think, uh, I think that was the airport below us. Yeah, right, okay. Switching uh, runways, three. keeping track of the storms, all add greatly to the pilot's heavy workload. Okay, 2217, glide slope, intercept all the way down. Missed approached right turn to 4,000. Uh, let's see, you got the airport, right? So yeah, I don't what? have the airport. Well, I'm, I'm saying you've got the ILS. Yeah, I got the ILS. Airline pilots, they make their money when they're flying into bad weather. When the weather goes down, now all of a sudden, the workload starts to increase because you have to factor in low clouds, rain, lightning, thunderstorms, wind, all of these elements start to bombard you the closer you get into the airport environment. American 1420, it appears we have a second part of this storm moving through. The wind now is 340 at 16 gust 34. With the storms worsening, the pilots need to make it to the airport as quickly as possible. You want to accept the short approach, keep it tight? Yeah, but if you can see the runway, because I, I don't quite see it. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's right there. All right, you see it? You just point me in the right direction, I'll start slowing down. Give me flaps 11. Damn, it's heading right over the field. American 1420, did you call me? Uh, yeah, uh, we got the airport, but we're going right in between clouds. Um, I, I think it's to my right, uh, off my three o'clock low, about uh, four miles. American 1420, that's it. Do you uh, want to shoot the visual approach or you want to go out for the ILS? A visual approach will allow 1420 to reach the airport faster than one that depends on instruments. Uh, well, yeah, uh, I can start the visual uh, if we can do it. American 1420's cleared visual approach, runway four right. If you lose it, need some help, let me know, please. But a visual approach means the pilots must keep the runway in sight at all times. The transcripts now reveal rising confusion on the flight deck as the captain struggles to fix the position of the airport. Okay, did you notice something? Did you see the airport there? Where? There, okay. Right. You're on a base for it, okay? It's, it's right there. Well, I'm on a base now? It's, it's like a dog leg. And we're coming in, and, and, and there it is, right there. Uh, I lost it. it you're downwind of it. it it's, it's, right, it's right there. Well, I, I still don't see it. 
uh, just vector me. I, I don't know. American 1420, monitor 118.7, runway 4 right, clear to land. The wind now 330 at 2-1. 7 will monitor, American 1420, thanks. Uh, clear to land, runway 4. See, if, See if those red lights there. Now, what are they in relation to? There's the runway. Uh, there's two runways. Yeah, I know. It, it, <sighs> see, we're losing it. I, I don't see how we can maintain visual. The pilots now have to abandon their direct visual approach and request help from Little Rock's instrument landing system. But this delays landing even further. Approach, American 1420. American 1420, yes, sir. Yeah, there's a cloud between us and the airport, uh, and we've lost the field. Um, we're on a vector. Uh, well, basically, we're on the last vector you gave us. Uh, which is like a dog leg, it looks like. Uh, American uh, 1420, can you fly heading 220? I'll take you out for the ILS. This news footage shows the storm on the night of the crash. As heavy rain cuts visibility even further, Captain Bushman becomes frustrated. See, I, I hate droning around visual at night and weather without having any clue where we are. The thing that was really getting to me was I knew we were getting very low. I knew that the rain was not letting up and that we were being uh, jolted around quite heavily. See how we're going right in the middle of this crap. All right. Approach American 1420. I know you're doing your best, sir, but uh, we're getting really close to this storm and uh, we'll keep it really tight if we have to. The plane was rocking and rolling at that point. It was pretty doggone unstable. I don't know what made me aware so doggone aware that we were gonna have a problem. I don't know what did that. As flight 1420 lines up for final approach, they are heading straight into the heart of the thunderstorm. The crisis for the flight crew is about to get even worse. With flight 1420 four minutes from touchdown, severe thunderstorms give the pilots another major problem. Blinding rain and thick cloud are obscuring the airfield. The visibility on the runway, known as RVR, is getting dangerously low. Oh, we're going right into this. Uh, American 1420, right now we have heavy rain on the airport. Uh, I don't have new weather for you, but uh, visibility is less than a mile. And the runway 4 right RVR is 3,000. Visibility is down to 3,000 feet. The pilots are unsure if it's safe to land. 3,000? Roger that, 3,000, American 1420. This is four right, correct? American 1420, that's correct, sir. And runway four right, clear to land. The wind's now 350 at 30 gusts 45. Can we land? 030 zero, zero at 45, American 1420. 3,000 RVR, we can't land on that. No, 3,000 if what you What do we need? At, no, it's 2,400 RVR. OK, right. Yeah, we're fine. All right, uh, 15. Landing gear down. And lights, please. As we descended, we descended through a very dark black cloud. The rain seemed to be going horizontal. It was windy enough, apparently, outdoors that the, the, the plane was moving around a lot. I'd never done this before. I buckled up really tight, almost uncomfortably tight, and I was concerned enough. I put my shoes back on and got ready to go. There was something going on that made me very nervous. The crosswinds are way over the limit. The pilots could divert to another airport, but they don't even as the weather gets worse. Wind shear alert, uh, center field wind 350 at 32 gusts 45, north boundary wind 310 at 29, northeast boundary wind 320 at 32. The jolts seemed to be much stronger than I'd ever felt. You could tell that the thunderheads were extremely close to the plane. I said words to the effect that if, if he tries to land in this weather, we'll crash. Flaps 28. Add 20. 
Then visibility falls drastically below the limit. American 1420, the runway full right RVR is now 1,600. Damn. The crew are rattled. Under pressure, they begin to make mistakes. Can't see anything. Looking for a 460. It's there. Couldn't see anything. The wind was throwing the plane around so violently. I think it was enough of a crosswind that I was afraid we were going to land on the wing. We felt like we were going to tip over. I mean, it just felt that bad. You want 40 flaps? Yeah, I thought I called it. I knew the way he was jockeying the plane and the sounds of the engines that he was trying to get lined up for the runway. And I couldn't see it, and I couldn't see it. But I could tell we were close. And I kept thinking, where's the runway? 1,000 feet, 20, 40, 40 land. This, this is a can of worms. Wind is 330 at 2.8. I'm going to stay above it a little. There's a runway off to your right. You got it? No. I got the runway in sight. You're right on course. I got it. Stay where I you got, got it. I got it. Most of the people at that point in the plane were just holding on really tight, just looking forward. I mean, it, like rigid. I suspected the worst. I mean, I really did. We might not get down. In the midst of fierce thunderstorms, Flight 1420 is about to land at Little Rock. Low visibility and high winds make the final approach treacherous. Wind 330 at 25. 500 feet. Plus 20. Wind 330 at 23. Damn, we're off course. No, I can't see it. We're way off. I can't see anything. Got it? Got it! 100 feet. 50 feet, 40, 30, 20, 10. We hit the runway real hard. We didn't slow down. We're down. We're sliding. Oh, no. We were still going very, very, very fast. And at that point, I thought, we're dead. On the brakes! It was just chaos. It was terrifying. It, it looked quite literally terrifying. Other one! Other one, other one! plane actually stopped. There was a moment of absolute, total silence. There was fire in front of me, and I could see debris, and it was silent. And I thought, oh my gosh, I'm dead. Well, I knew we were in deep trouble. You know, it's a process that started, and in some way it's got to end. It's going to end, and when it ends, how do I get out of here? Within those minutes, I heard a small scream, and I heard it get louder and louder and louder, like it was on a megaphone. And it hit me, that's my daughter. And it's like, oh, OK, we've, we've got to get out of here. You know, we've got to do something. The passengers struggled to get out before fire engulfed the cabin. I had a broken scapula, dislocated shoulder, and uh, cracked ribs, and all sorts of stuff going on. But I didn't feel a thing. I just wanted to get out. I was not going to die in that thing. I got out of that plane probably in 10 seconds. It's like being in war. Go, go, go. I'm yelling, get away from the plane. Run. Get away from the plane. Go. Go, go. Some folks looked like they'd been in an explosion. Their clothes were tattered. I saw a man using his cell phone to call for help. OK, I don't know where we're at, but there's a road that goes around the airport. Well, we've got a lot of people hurt.
traveling at over 100 miles an hour, the aircraft ran off the end of the runway, plowed down a 25-foot embankment, and slammed into a steel walkway. The plane was ripped into several pieces. The wreckage finally came to rest on the muddy banks of the Arkansas River. Ten passengers died in the crash. Captain Bushman was killed instantly when the cockpit was split open by the steel walkway. It was a shame I hadn't, literally a shame that I had not done more to save people. That's the worst nightmare I have. The U.S. National Transportation Safety Board was immediately notified. Greg Fife was the NTSB's chief investigator. The night American 1420 happened, I received a phone call about 1 o'clock in the morning from our communications center at the NTSB advising that there had been an aircraft accident at Little Rock and there may be some fatalities involved. Fellow investigator Don Ike was quickly on the scene. There's a sense of adrenaline as an accident occurs like this, where you're being launched to the accident scene. And there's a strong urge to get there, to try to find out what happened, to document the facts so we can prevent it from happening. The NTSB set up a command center close to the site. They would spend the next 18 months piecing together the events that led to the crash. We did have a basic idea when we got on scene of what had happened. We just didn't know why. We knew the airplane went off the end of the runway. We knew that the pilots couldn't stop it. We knew that the aircraft was destroyed going through this catwalk. We knew that the subsequent post-crash fire killed people. We just didn't know why at that point. The NTSB worked backwards from the impact, piecing together the sequence of events from the final approach all the way back to Dallas-Fort Worth. The first question for investigators was why the pilots had been unable to stop the plane. Analysis of the tire tracks left by the skidding plane showed a complete loss of control after touchdown. When you look at the width of those tire tracks, you then see that the airplane wasn't going straight, but in fact was sliding sideways. Here you have this machine that weighs 130, 140,000 pounds. It has 100 or so people on it. It is sliding uncontrolled off this runway. Something had gone terribly wrong on landing, and investigators had to find out why. They questioned the survivors of Flight 1420, who would provide an extremely important clue. The NTSB investigators needed to find out why Flight 1420 had slid uncontrolled off the runway. They set out to interview surviving passengers, many of whom were local to Little Rock. Their eyewitness testimony would point the inquiry towards the most important mechanical system used to slow a plane down after landing. We were really interested in were those passengers that were sitting in a position right near the wings who could look out the windows and tell us whether they saw the ground spoilers deploy. Spoilers are large flaps that flip up on landing, literally spoiling the airflow over the wings. This prevents them from giving lift and allows braking to take effect. Crucially, none of the passengers saw the spoilers deploy. To check their testimony, the NTSB examined information from the airplane's black boxes. The flight data recorder, which monitors the systems on board during flight, confirmed that the spoilers had failed to deploy. The implications were catastrophic. Flight 1420 had no hope of stopping in time. On the brakes! We're sliding! Oh, no! So was the failure of the spoilers to deploy a mechanical problem? 
or in the confusion of final approach, was it pilot error? To find out, the NTSB would make clever use of the cockpit voice recorder, or CVR. Make it out. You want 40 flaps? Yeah, I thought I called it. One of the key elements that the CVR team was listening for was the setting of the spoiler handle. We saw on the flight data recorder that the ground spoilers didn't deploy. We wanted to know if the handle had been actually armed or not. And we were looking for a specific click sound. We couldn't find that sound on the accident CVR, which led us to believe that the handle was never in the armed position at touchdown. Intensely busy in the cockpit, the pilot simply forgot to arm the spoilers. Had they deployed, the MD-80 aircraft might have overshot the runway, but it would have stopped before hitting the catwalk. The pilots had made serious and ultimately fatal errors, but investigators wanted to know why. They suspected that pressures earlier in the flight led to these mistakes. They turned their attention to the weather. It was clear to us that severe weather had been in the area around the time of the accident. How it played a part was one of the things we had to try to discover. And putting the radar images in, the observations, trying to put it all together would take weeks, of course, to get this information done. The NTSB wanted to know what role the weather had played in the crash and had the pilots been fully aware of the dangers. See how we're going right in the middle of this crap. One of the concerns that all pilots have when they're trying to land an aircraft is, of course, making sure that the crosswinds that they may experience don't exceed the capabilities of either themselves or the aircraft. The wind's now 3-5-0 at 3-0 gusts 4-5. Can we land? This particular flight crew had a limitation, not imposed by themselves, but imposed by the company, and that was that they were not allowed to exceed a 10-knot crosswind on a wet runway. Crosswind limits are clearly stated in the operating manual. The crew of 1420 were flying beyond regulation limits. This, this is a can of worms. There's a runway off to your right, you got it? No. The effect of the winds can be seen in this NTSB animation, showing the captain's desperate last maneuvers. Winds definitely impacted the flight. If you look at the animation, you'll see him fighting the winds. Definitely not good. We're down. On the brakes. Other one, other one. Other but when one, you start talking one. about a wet runway, thunderstorms, not a good. But were the pilots of 1420 aware of the hazards posed by the severe weather? For the NTSB, previous accidents had made the dangers of thunderstorms all too clear. In 1994, a US Air DC-9 fell victim to wind shear in North Carolina. The plane stalled at 250 feet and fell from the sky. A Delta TriStar crashed after flying into the most severe kind of wind shear that created an intense downdraft of air. So should the crew of 1420 have aborted the approach? There's the runway. Uh, there's two runways. Yeah, I know. See, we're losing it. I don't, I don't see how we can maintain visual. This NTSB weather animation overlays the path of the aircraft with ground radar images of the storm. Bushman and Oregle landed in lightning, torrential rain and hail, and the crosswinds gusting well over the limit. Based on the information that we had from ground-based weather radar, the flight crew of 1420 should have been seeing majority of that storm. They would have been seeing the leading edge going green, rapidly changing the yellow to bright red. I can't see anything. Looking for a 460. As they progressed towards Little Rock, they started to paint the bad weather, not only on their onboard radar, but they could see out the window lightning. And one of the key statements that this captain made, which basically summarized the entire flight, was the captain saying, I hate droning around visual at night and weather without having any clue where we are. I hate droning around 
at night when I don't know where I am. That was such a key statement. It was at that point by an experienced 10,000 hour captain that he should have abandoned the approach going into Little Rock and either gone to his alternate or made his way back to Dallas. But to make a statement like that and then continue an approach to an airport where you have a thunderstorm in progress over the airport is a recipe for disaster. But the pilots were not the only ones to be heavily criticized. As the investigation continued, American Airlines flight policy would come under fire and an industry-wide scandal was about to be exposed. For months after the crash of Flight 1420, the NTSB dug deeper into the circumstances surrounding the accident. The question was, who would take responsibility? American Airlines were reluctant to admit that their pilots had knowingly flown into a severe thunderstorm. Initially, they tried to pin the blame on the controller at Little Rock. Americans started legal action against the authorities responsible for airport controllers. Americans' lawyers claim that the crew of Flight 1420 had not been given all the current weather information. Uh, American 1420, um, your equipment's a lot better than uh, what I have. How's that final for 22 left looking? But after interviewing the controller at Little Rock, investigators were unconvinced. It's highly unlikely that the flight crew wasn't sufficiently informed about the nature of the weather and the severity of the weather not only en route, but of course, during the course of the landing at Little Rock. The focus turned back on the pilots. Lawyers representing the passengers were determined to get American Airlines to accept liability for the crash. I mean, it is about money in a way, because you want to make them pay. Because I saw the letters that they would write back to my lawyer, minimizing what we had been through minimizing my daughter's burns, cuts, the psychological effects it had on my son at age 15, uh, and my daughter, and me, and just minimizing everything. So you want to find a way to hurt him. Rene Salmons and many other survivors attended the NTSB public hearings held in Little Rock eight months after the disaster. With the captain dead, the co-pilot was the first to testify. As we went off the end of the runway, I could see the runway lights coming up, and I knew we were going off the end of the runway. I, I couldn't see anything in front of us, and all I thought was the gear would collapse, and we would continue to slide. It's got to be okay. And then all of a sudden, I felt the impact. Well, I followed it as close as I could. <laughs> you bet. I, mean, I wanted to know what happened. I went to all of the NTSB hearings. I was outraged. I was mad. For me, they didn't ask him the right questions. You know, I wanted to ask him, what were you thinking? Why did you all play chicken with our lives? The co-pilot's testimony was highly controversial. In his account of the final moments of the flight, he claimed to have told the captain to abort the approach, otherwise known as a go-around. Who can call for abandoning the approach? Uh, either pilot. Did you call for a go-around at any time? Uh, yes, sir, I did. It sounds like after reviewing the tape, you can definitely hear the go and the around, it seems like he talked at the same time I did, and I looked over at him, and he, was, he brought the airplane back on course. However, when NTSB specialists studied the cockpit voice tapes, they couldn't hear this statement. Damn, we're off course. No, I can't see it. We're way off. Even though he stood by that statement, we could never validate it. That led to a controversial finding, because we weren't really sure if that, would, that took place or not. The NTSB asked tough questions of the co-pilot, but was American Airlines training also at fault? Greg Fyth put an American Airlines manager on the stand. What were the company rules for pilots flying near thunderstorms? When asked the question, he basically responded that he just didn't want his pilots flying into that type of weather. Our pilots are forbidden to enter or depart a terminal area blanketed by thunderstorms. To the NTSB, this policy simply wasn't clear-cut enough. Well, that's a very subjective call for a pilot. Pilots need boundaries. You have to set limits. If there's convective activity, that is thunderstorm activity, it's within five nautical miles of the airport, there's lightning, there's wind shear, don't go there. The 
The deeper they looked, the more the NTSB found that flying into thunderstorms was disturbingly widespread. Extraordinary evidence given at the hearings revealed that the problem spread through the whole industry. Expert analysts from MIT spent weeks recording the flight paths of planes landing at Dallas-Fort Worth. They waited for thunderstorms and watched how pilots reacted. Their animation plots the planes coming into land, overlaid with radar images of the storms. Anything yellow or orange is a potentially severe thunderstorm. Of the 2,000 encounters with thunderstorms, two out of three pilots flew into the storm and landed their aircraft. I was very surprised by the testimony at the public hearing, given the fact that they're flying the best equipment, typically have the best training, have the best information available to them. For those decisions to be made, to continue into harm's way, it was very surprising to me that they tried to do that. Pilots know that if we go into that thunderstorm, we may not come out of that thunderstorm. And if we do, it may not be basically in one piece. Why did so many pilots fly into danger? The MIT researchers found pilots were more reckless if they were behind schedule, if it was night, and if aircraft in front of them were also flying into bad weather. In the Little Rock case, two of those three elements were present. It was night and they were running late. The MIT investigation was chilling evidence that the crash at Little Rock was part of a much wider problem. We're not seeing a major improvement, put it bluntly. There's a uh, limited time for training. Weather was a significant part that set up the stage of this accident. We do not condone any operation to be uh, conducted in such weather. It is a known severe weather hazard and it should have been suspended, no operation. Ironically, it also emerged that new technology may be partly to blame for bad decision making. Might it be we're desensitizing pilots, we're putting weather radar on board aircraft, we're putting wind shear detection systems on airplanes. Most of these systems only react when you're in the hazard. That time, it may be too late. But the root causes behind the crash of 1420 went even deeper. Why were the pilots so determined to land? Greg Feith found the answer back at Dallas-Fort Worth, before the flight even left the ground. There, he found signs of a deadly condition in aviation known as get their -itis. There may have been a sense of get their -itis. The flight crew knew that they were pushing their 14-hour duty day. It had been a long duty day. The airport's right there. Let's try it. Let's see if we can accomplish the mission. Pilots are goal-oriented. We're mission-oriented. We will stick our nose in there to try and see if we can accomplish the mission. Sometimes we will accomplish that mission, but sometimes we get too far into it that we can't bail out. We don't have any more options, and bad things happen. For Flight 1420, the pressures of Get Their Writers sparked a fatal series of mistakes and misjudgments. At the end of a long day, Rushing to beat the storms and get the passengers to their destination, the crew of Flight 1420 made the basic mistake that cost 11 people their lives. They forgot to arm the spoilers. They were so busy trying to get the plane on the ground that they forgot to do what they needed to do. They didn't have time to do it. After the accident, American Airlines revised their checklist procedures. Both pilots must now confirm that the spoilers are armed, ready for landing. In October 2001, the NTSB published their report. They concluded that the two main causes of the crash were first, the decision to land in a thunderstorm, and second, the pilot's failure to arm the spoilers. American Airlines declined to take part in this film or comment on the findings. As an investigator, I had over two years to basically criticize and determine what the captain was trying to accomplish. That particular captain had seconds to make decisions. 
based on the information he was getting. And while it's unfair for an acts investigator like myself to start pointing the finger, I wasn't there. I blame them, but I'm not angry per se at them. I don't waste my time with anger on them. They'd got nothing but black. You can understand it, um, but uh, I can't understand a person you know, wanting to kill himself either. We've been out and visited his grave at the Air Force Academy a couple, three times, and the guy just got caught up in a bad, bad situation. I mean, uh, been there, done that. One year after the crash, the survivors of Flight 1420 gathered at the site to remember those who died. For surviving passengers, the effects of the crash are long-lasting and profound. We, as a family, worked long and hard to work through it. We had many talks. It blew apart a lot of relationships. Uh, you find out who your real friends are. I cannot do enough to mitigate what happened to the individuals on an airplane. Life is a precious thing, and, and you're definitely um, here for a very short time. Uh, you know, all of a sudden, your life looks like about a second and a half long. The impact of the crash is something that I try to block out of my mind because I still feel a, a reaction. People ask me if I'm okay. Well, no, I'm not okay. No, we'll never be okay. I mean, what is this okay stuff? You're different. I mean, deal with it. I mean, that's the way we're gonna be. The day after um, it happened, when Adam and I were in the hospital in Samantha, um, Adam and I got up and we looked out the window and we just couldn't believe that life went on. We just couldn't believe cars were driving and it was sunny. And life went on, you know, because for us, life stopped. 3,000? In 1998, off Canada's east coast, a modern passenger jet run by one of the world's best airlines catches fire at 33,000 feet. In its final six minutes, communications from the cockpit cease. It's burning already! Then the plane plummets into the ocean. Two hundred and twenty nine people are dead. What caused the fire is a mystery. Many of the vessels uh, reported to the Canadian Navy vessel standing by on scene that they were finding bodies and making repeated requests. Uh, for more body bags and get the body so Now, terrible. after one of the largest investigations in aviation history, the complete story behind the loss of Swiss Air Flight 111 can finally be told. It's a wake-up call for the entire airline industry to ensure that what happened aboard Swiss Air 111 would never happen again. This accident investigation was a unique opportunity to assess the materials in airplanes. And the problem is not only just the stuff that can burn, but the fact you can't see it. When you really have fire on board, the clock is running against you. September the 2nd, 1998. Swiss Air Flight 111 prepared to depart New York's JFK International Airport en route to Geneva, Switzerland. 
The aircraft was a McDonnell Douglas 11, or MD-11, a model first developed in 1986 as a highly automated, modern replacement for the antiquated DC-10. It was considered one of the most reliable passenger jets in the skies, and Swiss Air pilots were among the world's best trained. Okay, after start checklist. Um, engine anti-ice. Not required. Roger, not required. Auto brakes. Take off. Swiss Air 111's pilots were Captain Roger, Urs Zimmermann two, and nine, First nine, Officer five. Stefan Love. Swiss Air 111, hold short, 3-1 left. Zimmermann encouraged an easygoing atmosphere in the cockpit, but he was also known for his by-the-book precision. When not flying, he was an instructor of new pilots for Switzerland's national airline. Take off checklist. Uh, flaps and slats. Flaps set, 15 degrees. Set at 15. On board were 215 passengers, 12 crew, and two pilots. Most were French, American, or Swiss. 23-year-old Stephanie Shaw was on her way home to her parents in Geneva. Stephanie uh, was blessed in many ways. She was uh, physically very attractive. She was an intelligent girl. She, uh, the reason she went to New York was that she had been invited to become a member of the World Economic Forum, which is based in Geneva. And she wanted to have this trip uh, before she joined. She was a darling, she, an absolute darling. 8.18 p.m. Swiss Air 111 Hemi, clear for takeoff. Clear for takeoff. Roger, Swiss Air 111. For safety, the Swiss Air pilots push the throttles forward together, ensuring no single pilot can botch a takeoff. We are V2. Swiss Air Flight 111 lifted off and made her way northeast toward the open Atlantic. For the first 15 minutes after takeoff, there was no communication from Swiss Air 111. It was an unusual, small detail that would later baffle investigators. Well, it does happen occasionally. They had not yet reached what we call the North Atlantic track system, where then you're not really usually in radio contact. So I thought it was a little abnormal, but it appears it was just nothing more than a mistaken radio frequency. When the guy dialed it in and swapped over the radio, he had put in the incorrect frequency and evidently uh, it just you know, they didn't make another attempt at contacting someone. It was strange, and uh, I agree with you. It was kind of, it's kind of like, whoa, that's that's interesting. Atlantic air traffic is handled by a remote center in Moncton, New Brunswick, Canada. Almost half an hour after takeoff, Captain Zimmerman made his first communication with Moncton. Moncton Center, Swiss Air 111 Heavy, good uh, evening, level 330. Swiss Air 111 Heavy, Moncton Center, good evening. Reports of uh, occasional light turbulence at all levels. Moncton, Swiss Air. It was a perfectly normal transatlantic crossing. In first class, Swiss Air passengers were among the first in the world to have a personalized in-flight entertainment network. Though now common, the system was an innovation in 1998. Passengers could choose their own movie, browse the internet, and gamble. They uh, evaluated the market and they thought that introducing a modern in-flight entertainment system combined with a gambling system so that passenger actually can use their credit card and gamble during long-range flights um, would make them more attractive. This luxury would be the source of controversy to come.
smell something? Yeah, what is that? Go have a look, I'll take the controls. Roger, you have control. First Officer Love investigated the area near the air conditioner vent. Harmless smoke traces from air conditioning systems are common on commercial jets. I don't see anything, Urs. And there's nothing up there now. You hail for me, Captain? Stefan and I were sure we smelled smoke a few seconds ago. Can you smell anything? I smell it too, yeah. Could you smell in the cabin before you came in? No, definitely not. They agreed that the air conditioner was the likely culprit. Can't see it or smell it anymore. Air conditioning, is it? Yeah. Please close it, thanks. Behind the sealed panel, the pilots could not see that the problem was getting worse. Less than 45 seconds after smoke disappeared in the cockpit of Swiss Air 111, it returned. Zimmermann followed Swiss Air procedure. There it is again. He made plans to divert to the nearest place to land. Find the closest place to land, Stefan. We'll need the nav charts from the library, uh, also weather data for the area. Boston's close. Not doing well at all up there. Zimmerman radioed air traffic control in Moncton, New Brunswick. Moncton Center, Swiss Air 111 Heavy, good evening. United 920 Heavy, Moncton Center, good evening. The controller dealt with another aircraft before responding to Swiss Air. Other aircraft calling, say again. Swiss Air 111 Heavy is declaring pan, pan, pan. We have smoke in the cockpit. Uh, request. Um, uh, immediate return to a convenient place, I guess. Boston. Pan, pan, pan is an international term used to notify air traffic control of an urgent situation. One step below declaring Mayday. You say to Boston you want to go? Uh, I guess Boston. Uh, we need for some weather there. Uh, we are starting right turn here, Swiss Air 111 Heavy. Swiss Air 111, roger, and ascent to flight level 310. 310. 310, Swiss Air 111 Heavy. This is the first interview with one of the air traffic controllers in Moncton. My name is Bill Pickerel, and on September 1998, September 2nd, 1998, I was one of two Halifax terminal controllers uh, working the evening shift. The pan uh, in any kind of a special uh, condition is usually dealt with uh, as an emergency, and this, in fact, was dealt with that way. The aircraft was immediately given priority, and the uh, high-level supervisor initiated a call to the Rescue Coordination Center. Pickerel's colleague determined that Swiss Air 111 was just 66 nautical miles from Halifax and 300 from Boston. But Captain Zimmerman had chosen an airport he knew. A lot of times when you're having a problem, you would rather be dealing with an issue where you're much more familiar with the airport because that relieves a little stress on you. This is an initial problem. He's sitting there, he's looking up there, and he's trying to think, well, I've got smoke here. Now, what does it mean? Let's see, where, where are we? where's the closest place I can go to that I can talk to a Swiss air mechanic? Boston. Swiss Air 111 Center. Swiss Air 111 Heavy, go ahead. Would you prefer to go into Halifax? Or is we better put the mask on? Uh, stand by. Realizing their location, Zimmerman decided Halifax was now the best option. Affirmative, Swiss Air 111 Heavy. We prefer Halifax from our position. Swiss Air 111, Roger. Proceed direct to Halifax. Descend now to flight level 290. 
Level 290 to Halifax with their 111 Heavy. A British Airways pilot in the area offered the crew what little help he could. Swiss Air 111 Heavy from Speedbird 214. I can give you the Halifax weather if you like. Swiss Air 111 Heavy, uh, we have the uh, oxygen masks on. Uh, go ahead with the weather. It's the 300 Zulu weather. Warrior. Swiss Air 111 commenced its descent to below 30,000 feet. The pilot's calm and in control. It would take about 20 minutes to reach Halifax. Over. Roger, Swiss Air 11 Heavy, we copy 2980. Swiss Air 11, you're cleared to 10,000 feet, and the Halifax altimeter is 2980. Swiss Air 11 Heavy, 2980 at 10,000 feet. And Swiss Air 11, can you tell me what your fuel on board is? Uh, stand by for this. Speedbird 1506 is at Tusky listening out. Speedbird 1506, Roger. The controller signed off with another aircraft. His jurisdiction was high altitude flights. As Swiss Air was on descent to Halifax, he hands over responsibility to Bill Pickrell. At that point, uh, everything was normal. Uh, I, I gave the pilot an initial descent, and uh, he requested to level off at an intermediate altitude to get the cabin in order for the landing, which I took to mean that they needed to pack away dinner trays and uh, things like that. It was an indication to me that uh, uh, while his situation was unusual, uh, that uh, they weren't considering it as uh, an emergency at that time. Watch your speed, Stefan. Don't descend too fast. Roger. Here, have the uh, cabin crew prepare for landing. We'll be setting down in Halifax in about 20 minutes. I'm about to start the checklist here. Yes, Captain Zimmerman. Zimmerman had two checklists for smoke in the cockpit. To complete both would take 20 minutes. This was Swiss Air Company policy. In the meantime, Love continued the descent into Halifax. Stefan, I'll need you to handle the radio while I do this checklist, all right? 119 or point two for the Swiss Air 111 Heavy. Roger. Swiss Air 111 was now at about 25,000 feet. Pickerel advises them to descend to 3,000. But First Officer Love said he'd rather fly at 8,000 until the passenger cabin was cleared. Their attitude underscored the sense of control in the cockpit. Uh, we would From my point of view, it uh, gave all initial appearances that it should be a fairly straightforward operation, that uh, assuming that uh, everything happened normally, the aircraft uh, would require a minimum of handling to uh, uh, lead them into Halifax. Swiss Air 111, you can descend to three, level off at an intermediate altitude if you wish, just advise. But Pickerel was concerned the plane was not coming down fast enough. It appeared that the aircraft uh, might have been a little bit high, and uh, I wanted to ensure that the pilots were aware of how uh, far they were from the airport, how many miles they had to fly, so that they could uh, judge their own descent and make their decision about what they wanted to do. Roger, at the time we descend to 8,000 feet, and we are clear at any time to 3,000 feet. I give you advice. Okay, can I vector you uh, to set up for runway 06 at Halifax? Uh, Roger, a vector for six will be fine. Swiss Air 111 heavy. Swiss Air 111, Roger, turn left heading of uh, 030. Left heading 030 for the Swiss Air 111 heavy. Captain Zimmerman needed information for the unfamiliar airfield but his flight bag was out of reach. He summoned the flight attendant to help. You held me, Captain. For two minutes now. I need that flight bag there. It's got the approach charts for Halifax. <clears throat> Take it back to your crew. Yes, Captain.
This is your Major de Cabin speaking. The chief flight attendant notified passengers that the flight was being diverted. There was no panic. The plane was flying normally, and there was no sign of smoke in the cabin. Swiss Air 111, the localizer frequency is 109 or decimal niner. You've got 30 miles to fly to the threshold. Uh, we're going to need more than 30 miles. But still at more than 20,000 feet, Swiss Air 111 was too high to make a landing in just 30 miles. The frequency is a 109 or decimal niner for the localizer. OK, Roger, 109.9. And uh, we are turning left, heading uh, north. Swiss Air 111 heavy. And we've got to dump fuel. Agreed. So far, communications from Swiss Air had been calm. Still, Moncton Center initiated emergency efforts at Halifax Airport. Preparing ground crews for an emergency, Pickerel sought information from the pilots. souls on board and your fuel on board, please, for emergency services. Roger. At this time, fuel on board is two, three, zero tons. We have to dump some fuel. May we do that in this area during descent? Pickerel was surprised to learn so late that Swiss Air 111 needed to dump fuel. At that point, it became more of a complicated situation. In fact, with every transmission after that, it became more and more complicated. Pickerel considered his options for a safe place that wouldn't take the aircraft too far from Halifax. He decided to direct the plane over St. Margaret's Bay, about 30 miles from the airport. The other choice, uh, if he had said he needed to stay close, was to uh, start the aircraft in a, a, a right-hand turn to uh, set him up for any of the other runways. I had to keep him flying in a, in a circle or a constant track so that he wouldn't fly back into his own fuel, which would have been uh, not good. Dumping fuel is standard procedure. A fully fueled passenger jet is too heavy and could break up on landing. Are you able to take but co-pilot Love wondered if, given their situation, they might okay, forgo short, the regulations. They want us to turn to the south. Should we just forget about dumping and just land? No, dump it. OK, we are able for a left or right turn to the south in order to dump. I initiated the vector back toward St. Margaret's Bay to start him in that direction. It indicated to me that, again, uh, it wasn't uh, a critical situation on board. Then, in fact, he did have time to be able to go back and uh, dump his fuel over the water. Swiss Air 111, uh, roger. Turn left, heading of uh, 200 degrees, and advise me when you're ready to dump. It will be about 10 miles before you're off the coast. We will still be within about 25 miles of the airport. Roger, we are turning left, 200. In that case, we are going to descend to only 10,000 feet in order to dump the fuel. Roger, maintain 10,000. I'll advise you when you're over the water. It will be very shortly. Roger. While Zimmerman continued with his checklist, Love accidentally transmitted to Bill Pickerel in Moncton. Are you in the emergency checklist for air conditioning smoke? Yes. Uh, Swiss Air 111, say again, please. Uh, sorry, that was not for you. Swiss Air 111 was asking internally. OK. Airspeed is decreasing below 306. A level off speed here. Let's fly the plane as you see that stuff on. Swiss Air 111, continue left heading 180. You'll be off the coast in about 15 miles. Left heading 180, roger. Swiss Air 111 and maintaining at 10,000 feet. Roger. Cabin bus off. Cabin bus off, roger. The cabin bus switch knocked out all the lighting in the cabin. It was an indication for the passengers that something was wrong, but hardly alarming. Ladies and gentlemen, we have temporarily lost the lights in the cabin. Please remain calm. The crew will be coming around with flashlights to assist in landing. Despite a cockpit filled with smoke, there was still no trace in the passenger cabin. <laughs> you will be staying within about uh, 35, 40 miles of the airport if you have to get back to the airport in a hurry. 
Okay, that's fine with us. Please tell us when we can start to dump the fuel. Suddenly, the aircraft sent out a warning that the smoke was a sign of a more serious problem. Autopilot disconnect. Copy that. Autopilot disconnect. Swiss Air 111. The autopilot disconnected because the plane's computers sensed erratic readings. In the next 90 seconds, those readings went haywire. 11,000 and 9,000 feet. Swiss Air 111, you can block between 5,000 and 12,000 if you wish. One by one, the instruments failed. The calm in the cockpit dissolved. Copy that. We are clear between 12 and 5,000 feet. We are declaring emergency now. Swiss Air 111 at time 0124. Then the two pilots spoke simultaneously. Combined with other distractions in the control room, Pickerel was unable to hear a critical transmission. Love's declaration that they must land immediately. We are dumping fuel now. We must land immediate. Swiss Air 111, just a couple more miles. I'll be right with you. Roger that. And we are declaring emergency now. Swiss Air 111. Missing this transmission is a moment Bill Pickrell relives today. I'm not sure that it's a feeling that you can adequately describe. I recall reviewing the events of that night a thousand times to determine if there was something additionally that I could have done or if there was uh, some mistake that I might have made or was there any way that I contributed to this. And eventually I was able to come to the point of realization that there wasn't anything that I could have done, you know, that everything that could have was done. Now there was nothing to do but wait. Thirty seconds after declaring an emergency, the pilots of Swiss Air 111 faced an inferno. All my screens are down. I'm flying on standby instruments, maintaining 300. Swiss Air 111, you are cleared to commence your fuel dump on that track and advise me when your dump is complete. Soon after I gave him authorization to commence the fuel dump, um, there was no acknowledgement. Um, initially, I wasn't concerned by that because I considered that he was probably doing the fuel dump. He was reviewing a checklist. He was busy doing things. And as per our training, we're told not to bother the pilots in those kinds of situations. Swiss Air 111, check. You are cleared to start the fuel dump. no further communication from the aircraft. Six minutes later, residents of Peggy's Cove heard a devastating explosion. No one knew what had happened to 229 people after six minutes of silence. It was probably one of the most helpless feelings that any individual can have, not being able to do anything but just sit and watch the target and hope that it would turn back toward the airport. And of course it didn't. The following morning, would-be rescuers glimpsed the terrible remains of Swiss Air 111. Only one body was discovered intact. In 
Geneva, Ian Shaw had a premonition about his 23-year-old daughter, Stephanie. That night, the night on which she was due to return, for reasons I can't explain even now, I was restless and I was disturbed, and um, I uh, slept early and woke uh, while my wife was still awake and asked her if she had had news of Stephanie. No, she had not, but she didn't expect to have news of Stephanie. We knew she was coming on that flight and that she would certainly expect me to be at the airport to fetch her in the morning. I awoke uh, around 6 Geneva time, and on television there was a report of the crash of Swissair 111. And I knew instantaneously that we had lost our daughter. Air traffic controller Bill Pickrell was in shock. It's a strange experience. Um, I'm not sure that I can adequately express the feelings, but it's... Um, you work to, to provide a service and you, uh, you read about aircraft flying into a mountain or ending up in a swamp in some distant country, but you never expect that it's going to happen in your backyard. And when it does, it's a uh, kind of a lonely experience, I guess, in one sense. The Transportation Safety Board of Canada launched what would become the largest disaster investigation in the nation's history. They only knew Swiss Air 111 experienced a cockpit fire, but what caused it remained a mystery. Well, this accident was a challenging one to investigate in that initially, of course, we had to recover the aircraft from about 55 meters of water, around 185 feet. Of course, it was also in many pieces. Uh, as it turns out, it was in a couple of million pieces. So that was the initial challenge. And then after that, of course, uh, when you have so many pieces, you need to de determine which are the relevant ones and what are these pieces telling you about what happened and why. The TSB embarked on a five-stage plan. First, divers were deployed to survey the wreckage. They discovered that the plane was smashed into millions of pieces. But as the autumn weather worsened, the risks to divers increased. At this rate, the salvage would take years to complete. Stage two. With help from the United States Navy, remote operated vehicles began a more detailed search. The ROVs helped investigators survey the site. But the question remained, how to recover tiny pieces of twisted metal from the bottom of the sea? We have to go through little bits of airplanes, little pieces. In Swiss Air, we've had about two million pieces of airplane, and we pretty much almost had to look at them all because we had to discredit certain things, terrorists, uh, bombs, various other types of faults. The TSB's investigators finally got the breakthrough they'd been seeking, the black boxes. Recordings of cockpit and computer data told investigators that everything on the plane was working perfectly until the last few minutes. When the crew declared the pan, 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 that they had smoke in the cockpit, after going through all of these parameters, uh, we found no anomalies or no problems in any of that flight data that suggested there was a problem with the aircraft. So this led us to believe that the crew had a relatively operational aircraft, aside from the the smoke in the cockpit that they noted, uh, everything else appeared to be working fine. And uh, as they were making their plan to, uh, to send the aircraft, they experienced a series of systems failures that were in rapid succession and exponential. Copy that, autopilot disconnect. Swiss Air 111, we must fly manually now. Mike Poole's CVR team then faced a serious setback. The last six minutes on both flight recorders were missing. You're losing systems rapidly on the airplane in that 90-second period that things are happening very fast. And the last thing we, one of the last things we know about was the two recorders went offline. So the fire has uh, presumably breached the lines 
breached the, uh, breached the sources to these recorders and has stopped them. With the failure of the black boxes, investigators were no closer to learning how or where the fire started on Swiss Air 111. Stage three, barges were deployed to scour the seabed for evidence. One by one, sad remnants of the airplane reached the surface. Her engines were recovered. Then the landing gear. These were among the largest pieces of Swiss Air 111 to be recovered. The rest were mere fragments, dredged up in a painfully slow process. Stage four, a nearby military hangar provided a makeshift lab for the growing team of forensic investigators. Representatives from the American NTSB, Boeing, Swiss Air, and the Royal Canadian Mounted Police joined in the search for answers. Pieces of Swiss Air 111 arrived by the truckload, organized into various categories for analysis. Soon the hangar was stacked to capacity with the biggest jigsaw puzzle in aviation history. All the investigators knew for sure was that an initially small cockpit fire suddenly turned to catastrophe. The team sorted through nearly 155 miles of wiring retrieved from the wreckage of Swiss Air 111. Here, the first real clue, evidence of electrical arcing. Scorch marks on metal reveal that the source of the fire was in the back of the cockpit, directly behind the first officer. By examining the aircraft's wiring plans, investigators found a likely suspect, the entertainment system in first class. The system had some major deficiencies. It was getting very hot. It drew a lot of power. And uh, thereby, for example, raising the cabin, uh, cabin temperature uh, considerably, because it was always running. They did not install a simple off switch, nor did they install appropriate cooling systems to cool the system down. The TSB's investigators finally thought they had the breakthrough they'd been seeking. Our report indicates that there was a design flaw in the way the in-flight entertainment network installed in the first class and business class uh, sections of the aircraft were installed, uh, integrated into the electrical system of the airplane. When Captain Zimmerman threw the cabin bus switch, all power to the cabin should have been switched off but the entertainment system remained on, overheating. If you'd ask most pilots, they would say, well, if I push the cabin butt switch, it's gonna turn off the things behind the cockpit. It's gonna isolate that electrically for me so that I don't have to worry about that and that I can just concentrate on those things that might affect me flying the airplane. Well, as it turns out that this switch was kind of bypassed in, in this case for this IFN, or or entertainment system. Swiss Air immediately disabled the entertainment systems on the rest of its fleet, and the US National Transportation Safety Board ordered an inspection of cockpit wiring on all MD-11s. Unfortunately, this simple solution proved insufficient. By the time that cabin switch was turned off, the fire was well underway, and uh, so that had no real um, bearing on the the initiation or propagation of the fire in the Swiss Air 111 aircraft. But investigators determined that the problem with the entertainment system alone could not have brought down Swiss Air 111. The search for answers continued. Stage five. Undaunted, the TSB reconstructed the MD-11 from the wreckage. A wireframe mock-up they called the jig provided a spine for placing tiny pieces back where they once belonged. 
the reconstruction revealed that the fire spread with alarming speed from the cockpit back into the first-class galleys. Some metal showed heat damage from temperatures as high as 600 degrees centigrade. As the investigation continued, some argued that the actions of the pilots may have contributed to the disaster. Some experts charged that Zimmerman and Love's by the book approach may have cost them their lives. Some operators emphasized in a very early stage, land as soon as possible, and then if you have time, go into the checklist. Others uh, said, here's the checklist, and at the end of the checklist, if that doesn't help, then land as soon as possible. Pretty contradictory to basic flying instructions where Student pilots uh, learn at a very early stage that whenever you have smoke, you have a fire, and fire means land as soon as possible. Emergency light switch on. Emergency light switch on. Unfortunately, in this case, the way the checklist was written, it didn't identify that now start towards the divert. It started more on, let's try to see if we can solve the problem. And. Uh, so now, all of a sudden, you're taking on a problem that just kind of crept up on you. You weren't expecting it. Uh, we're going to need more than 30 miles. But the TSB considered the timeline. Investigators determined that Swiss Air 111 would not have made Halifax Airport under any circumstances. There just wasn't enough time. In our calculation, uh, we uh, showed that starting at the ideal descent point from 33,000 feet, uh, which was uh, at about uh, 10, 14 p.m. that night. It would take some 13 minutes to get the airplane onto the ground, which would take us to 10, 27 p.m. By 10, 24, the systems in the aircraft were starting to deteriorate. So we believe that under these circumstances, uh, the crew would not have been able to successfully land the airplane under those conditions with the amount of time that they had. Whatever caused the fire on Swiss Air, it happened at a lethal speed. The mystery remained. A year passed. Then another ambitious operation began. The TSB hired a sophisticated Dutch salvage ship, Queen of the Netherlands. The vessel has a gigantic vacuum system, capable of dredging even the tiniest pieces of Swiss Air 111 from the ocean floor. A mixture of seawater, silt and aircraft were pumped into the ship's hold. This cargo was then pumped into a specially constructed reservoir on shore. When the water drained away, investigators found another million pieces of the aircraft. Any one of them may have held the clue to what caused the catastrophic fire. The painstaking sorting once again resumed. Finally, after 15 months, they found what they'd been seeking, a single faulty wire. We looked at all of the possible sources of uh, heat that might start a fire in that area, and in this instance, um, we did uh, discover a wire that uh, arced in that way, and right next to it was some very flammable material called uh, metallized polyethylene terephthalate covering material that uh, covers the insulation blankets. This polyethylene insulate, which lined the MD-11, is common on commercial airlines worldwide. It has passed the industry's flammability tests that require materials to self-extinguish after a reasonable period of time. The investigation now took an abrupt turn. 
Instead of seeking the cause of the fire, the TSB now focused on the flammable materials that fueled it. This thermal acoustical material that was in this aircraft was very flammable, even though it passed a test. It does sustain and it does propagate flame. So this investigation did focus on the flammability of materials and the requirement to reassess the criteria that is used to certify materials, not just thermal acoustical insulation blanket material, but also other materials that goes into aircraft, much of it in hidden areas. Investigators now had their answer. A wire arced in a closed space behind the cockpit. The arc ignited the insulation, which in turn lit other materials, such as foams and plastics. The pilots could not sense how quickly the fire intensified. But 14 minutes after they declared pan, 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 the fire disabled all electronics in the cockpit. The black boxes went dead. A forensic examination also shed light on the desperate final minutes in the cockpit. Love was in his seat. Captain Zimmerman was not, likely fighting the fire and probably dead before impact. The uh, first officer was probably trying to find a place where he could put this big airplane. Um, he just didn't have a lot going for him. He didn't have a lot of instrumentation left. And I'm sure he was looking for something, some indication that would give him an idea of where he could put the airplane down, maybe even ditch the airplane. What is known is that the first officer was in his seat, whether he was uh, unconscious, conscious, maybe had severe degree burns on his skin. It's not known. We know the captain was not in his seat, so very likely he was trying to fight the fire that the checklists were found uh, molten together, the pages, indicates that they were used to fight a fire. At 10.30 Halifax time, Love shut down engine two. Investigators determined that he probably received a warning the engine was on fire. Chillingly, it proved that Love was alive a minute before impact. They could not determine whether the passengers were aware of the fire, at least until the very final moments. There were traces found of soot and smoke extending as much far to the business class overhead area. Whether the passengers have smelled the smoke, it's not known. Uh, DNA analysis showed that they had no residue in their body. The aircraft hit the water with a force of 350 Gs. The TSB spent four and a half years and 40 million US dollars analyzing the wreckage of Swiss Air 111, the largest air disaster investigation in Canada's history. Their conclusion? Flammable materials do not belong on commercial aircraft. The rate of progression in this airplane, I think, surprised us and surprised uh, others. Uh, and uh, that's why we emphasize, again, the importance of um, raising the bar on the flammability standards for materials used in airplanes. Ian Shaw waited four years for the report to reveal the fatal flaw that took the life of his daughter. The truth has not diminished his anger at Swiss Air. There has to be accountability. If you are involved in wrongdoing, you must be held accountable. And you must declare your sense of respons responsibility. Otherwise, you are hiding. And you are hiding, in this case, behind the flag of Switzerland. I think it's unbelievable. In the aftermath, Swiss Air decided to remove the flammable insulate from its entire fleet. They also made changes to checklist procedure, reducing response time in a cockpit smoke emergency. Swiss Air did something very interesting. They modified their entire Swiss Air MD-11 fleet. According to all these findings, they built in cameras and smoke detectors, even in, into hidden areas. 
where pilots have a little TV monitor and they can see whenever there is a smoke warning, which makes them all help gain time. And that's the most important when you have the case of, when you have a fire. But plagued with financial problems, the mighty Swiss Air shocked the industry when it declared bankruptcy in October 2001. The flammable insulation that set Swiss Air ablaze remains in two-thirds of commercial airplanes today, but not for very much longer. The metallized polyethylene terephthalate material has been essentially banned from aircraft, and the criteria to certify that kind of material for use in airplanes has been worked on. It has not been put into law as yet, but uh, we look forward to that being done, so the criteria is more stringent. The US Federal Aviation Administration has given a deadline of 2005 to remove the material from all commercial aircraft. This major overhaul is designed to ensure that what took place on Swiss Air 111 will never happen again. The industry is trying to remove it, but it's, I don't think they're removing it um, as quickly necessary as they could. There's always that battle. How expensive is it to do something that's replacement, or are you going to replace it in an airplane you're going to throw away in another couple years? We have to live within certain economic realities. For Ian Shaw, losing his daughter so suddenly and violently has left a permanent emotional scar. He left his wife and his wealth behind in Geneva and now runs a modest restaurant in Nova Scotia in view of the sea where his daughter died. Why would I come here to this particular point in Nova Scotia? A lot of people have said, oh yes, we fully understand you want to be close to your daughter and, and uh, the point where the plane crashed. That is no part of my being here. Swiss Air um, ripped out of me any possibility of proximity to my daughter. I found a comfort in the awareness of the presence of the eternal ocean, the ocean which has been going backwards and forwards for many, many, many thousands, millions of years. I came here because I had to. Um, I, I can't give a fully rational declaration to you of why I came here. I can only say to you, I am in the right place for the wrong reasons.